It's not up to the clergy to be the church. Our scripture today is found in 1 Peter chapter 2. It is printed in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along. Also, if you would like to use the Pew Bible, you can find it on page 233. Again, that's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, 10, and 21. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called upon you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. <coughs> Once you were not a people, but now you, got, you are God's people. Once you, had no, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And in verse 21, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning again. It is truly a pleasure to be here. And the reason that we're doing this handoff sermon this morning is because I wanted you all to hear how wonderfully Tina speaks. She does a marvelous job. And beside that, this would be the third year that I would have had the pulpit the entire time. And I thought you might be sick and tired of hearing from me. Today is a very special day in the life of our church. It's Laity Sunday. Um, really and truly, we're jumping it a bit because Laity Sunday technically is the third Sunday of October. But we are celebrating Laity Sunday today. United Methodist Church has a long-standing history of Laity Sunday. Um, as early as 1928, Layman's Day was being talked about, particularly in the South. Can you believe this? For once, the South was the leader in this movement of the laity movement. By 1929, the Methodist Episcopal Church South had an official day called Layman's Sunday. And as early as 1940, let's see, I have it, 1944, the idea of Laity Sunday had made it to our Book of Discipline. So the idea of the laity and the role of the laity within the church has, is one of long standing in our tradition, in our faith tradition. The word laity comes from a Greek word, laos, L-A-O-S, which means the whole people of God, all the church, the body of Christ. We laity expect an awful lot from our ordained clergy. I think this is probably well illustrated by a, a, a story that was told by Reverend Allen, Joseph Allen, of St. Anthony's Church, which is found in um, New Jersey. And he said that there was a young preacher who was just fresh out of seminary, all full of fire and wanting to preach, wanting to save people, wanting to serve his congregation. And so he was about to be assigned to his very, very first church. So he was in talking with the bishop, and the bishop said, Now, you know, this church is an old church. It's been there a long time, and the people are very wonderful. They're very dedicated, but they have a reputation for testing their ministers. They like to test their dedication. They like to test their spirituality and their willingness to serve their congregation. So don't be surprised when this new church of yours tries to test you. Just be ready for it. Well, this young preacher, he was ready to go. I'm ready, I'm ready. So he was appointed to his church, and he had been there about a month and had been preaching, thought things were going pretty well. He was even learning a few of the names of the folks that were there. And it was time for the annual church picnic. Well, this town happened to be located near a very large lake. And they had an island in the middle of this large lake. And that was the place that this church had their picnic. So they would go on this particular Sunday and everybody would bring everything. And I don't think they had a pit crew, or it was called that, but they probably had something that was similar to our pit crew. And they would take all of the food to, to grill outside and people would bring potato salad and they'd bring 
watermelon, they bring pies, they bring everything, we just bring it over there. Everybody get on pontoon boats and they load them up and they go across the lake and they would end up on the island and that was where they would have their, their cookout and their picnic and their church fellowship time and then it was just a wonderful success. Everybody always had a great time. Well, they loaded up the pontoon boats and about two of those pontoon boats had actually docked on the island and it was about time for the pontoon boat that had the preacher on it and there was some of the finance chair bill I think was on that particular boat and, and maybe the um, stewardship chair, Joe, was maybe on that boat. And so they were there and they were, they were all, you know, kicking back, you know, Bubba's, you know how they like to do, they like to chat and chew. They think women talk a lot, but mm -mm. it's the men that do. Anyway, so they get ready and they, they're looking around, they're about to dock. And Bill looks at Joe and said, oh my goodness, we left those hot dogs back on the other side of the lake. And the young preacher thinks, this is a test. This is a test. And so he says a little prayer, quick prayer to, to God to help him be like Peter was. And he says, don't worry, I'll go get him. So he swings first one leg and then the other leg over the side of the pontoon boat, casts his eyes heavenward and starts walking across the water. They're watching him walk across the water. There goes that young preacher. He gets off the lake, he walks up, he gets the hot dogs, picks up that ice chest, and he starts walking back. About the time he gets to the boat, Joe pokes Bill in the ribs and says, see, that bishop sent us a preacher, couldn't even swim. <laughs> we expect a lot of our clergy, <laughs> like that little church in, in, uh, in New Jersey. It's not up to the clergy to be the church. The clergy shepherds us, the clergy serves us, guides us, helps us, works with us. But it's like the children's song that's in our hymnal, so therefore it's not just a children's song. We are the church. The laity is the body of Christ. We are all called, we are all empowered at our baptism with gifts of the Spirit, and those gifts of the Spirit, by definition, are supposed to be used to serve what? The church. We're called to use those gifts to be in ministry to those around us. And if the pews are empty in the church, whose fault is it? Not Mike's, even though, well, I'm just joking. Mike <laughs> preaches a good sermon. Not Mike's fault. Not Angela's fault. Everything's Tom's fault. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not Tom's fault or Stanley's fault. It's our fault. Because we have failed to get out there and be the example and bring people in. If there is something that has to be done, and we were talking earlier today about the ministries of the church, they should be laity-driven because those gifts and graces that we're all given, that we all receive, those gifts and graces should be what drives us in mission. They should be what drives us to serve people in particular ways. You know, there is a... And I always get vision, mission, and purpose mixed up, so I'm probably going to screw this one up. But there's a mission statement for the United Methodist Church. And part that mission statement says, we are all to go make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the whole world. Have you ever heard that before? And we have enfolded that portion of the United Methodist Church mission statement into, what is it, Mike, our vision? Okay, our purpose, see, he keeps me straight. Into our purpose statement. What is a disciple? What's the disciple? What is a disciple? A definition. A disciple is a person who experiences the love, forgiveness, and acceptance of God following the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, demonstrates fruit of the Spirit, who lives in loving relationship with disciples and serves 
in ministry and mission, leading others to become disciples as well. Our church is like a house of cards. And I use this for illustration purposes. If this side is the laity and this side is the clergy and they lean on each other, that, that card teepee is going to stand up straight, isn't it? But if one side doesn't do their job, what happens? The card house collapses. Same thing with the other side. We are dependent on each other, and I won't use the word codependent because that's a little joke and it might be too subtle for you to catch. <laughs> but we both work together, laity and clergy, to create the people of God, to go make disciples in service, serving the world and each other. So what is a servant? And when we think of a servant, do we think of that positive or do we think of it as negative? I generally think of being a servant as negative. As a child, I grew up and my favorite movie was Cinderella. Now some of you that are younger out there maybe got to watch Cinderella more frequently than I did, but when I was a child, I didn't have Cinderella on a DVD, I didn't have it on Blu-ray, I didn't even have it on one of those old VHS tapes. Nope, I had to wait once a year, it came on. Every year I got to watch Cinderella once a year. And that evil, cruel stepmother making that poor little Cinderella serve the mother and those mean sisters. I decided that servanthood wouldn't be fun. But have you ever looked at how Cinderella reacted to that? Cinderella didn't throw a fit. She didn't get mad. She maintained hope through her dreams. And she remained kind and gentle and sweet. She had faith that someday her dreams of happiness would come true and her kindness would be repaid. Cinderella's attitude helped me see servanthood is an opportunity. It's not a burden. The King James Dictionary says that a servant is one who yields obedience to another one. A person who voluntarily serves another. A person who's employed or used as an instrument in accomplishing God's purposes. So what is our attitude when we're asked to, to serve? Are we one of those that quickly raises our hand and says, pick me, send me, let me do it? Are we the type that looks down at the ground and shuffles our feet and refuses to make eye contact and in our minds we're going, don't ask me to do that. Don't let me have to do this. What's our attitude? What are we thinking? In our scripture today from 1 Peter verse 21, we read, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. What examples did Christ leave for us? He left us an example of how to serve. Not because we're forced to serve, but because we're called to serve. He left us an example of how to serve because of that four-letter word. You know it. Love. We're called to serve to put others first, not ourselves. We're called to serve with humility. In Mark chapter 9, we hear Jesus telling the disciples, anyone who wants to be first must be last and the servant of all. Why would Jesus say this? Well, just immediately before this, those disciples, you know, they never seemed to quite get it right. They were arguing over which one of them was the greatest. They're right there with Jesus and they're arguing who's going to sit on his right hand and who's going to sit on his left hand. And so what does Jesus say? He kind of kind of gives them a little smack, and he says, gosh, guys, guys, if you want to be first, you have to be last. You have to be a servant. Jesus was a servant leader, and we've seen this throughout the scriptures. Just last week, we had Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. Can you imagine sitting in a corporate boardroom and having the CEO of the company 
come in and want to wash your feet? Or maybe just serve your, your drinks and your food? That's not what we see. In the world, in today's world, we see people wanting power. We see people wanting prestige. We see people wanting to be served. But the call is for us to be servants, to serve others, to do all that we can to help the ministry and further the ministry of Christ, to be his hands and his feet. So I want to challenge each of you to consider the lay servant ministry program. Now, I know you're sitting there saying, I'm already involved. Why do I need to get involved in this program? Well, the answer is, this program offers a renewal and a re-energizing for those that are already in service. It also equips and trains people that haven't been involved and gives them ways that they can get involved. We currently have five members in this church who are involved in the lay servant ministry program. We have Julie Adams, we have Sam Vogt, we have Debbie Whitcomb, we have Becky Walker, and myself. We also have two members who are planning to attend the training at the end of October, and that are Stretch Dunn and Priscilla Haynes. We would love to have each of you get involved. You can see any of us and find out more information, or you can go to the church website. There's a link right to the Lay Servant Ministry Program. I promise you that you will learn more about your faith, more about the United Methodist Church, and more about serving opportunities. As we are true to the call of Christ, we will find our place to serve, and we will serve the Lord with love and with humility. We will be open to new opportunities, and we will remember that if it is to be, it is up to me. So as you open your hearts to see Christ in those that you serve, I pray that you will hear your call to the priesthood and that you will hear your call to be in mission and in ministry. That you will be thankful that you have been called out of the darkness and into the marvelous light. And that you will declare your praises in all that you are and in all that you do. Amen.